to invite to the stage Christy Lee Minahan, excuse me, uh, to speak about uh, the embedded future of Monero's proof of work. Uh, as soon as we get the slides up on the stage, I'll invite you up just one second. Wonderful. Everybody, please uh, give Chrissy Lee Manahan a hand. Oh, talking never gets easy, even after the uh, hundredth time. Oh, so, today, the embedded future of Monero's proof of work. So, I'm a big subscriber to chaos theory. Uh, chaos theory, the mathematical definition that is, is that systems are inherently sensitive and a very small change in a starting condition can lead to very large changes over time. Now, the other common definition is more commonly known as the butterfly effect, which is, oops, there we go, the theory that the smallest change can set off a chain reaction of very large events that can change a system dr drastically. So, the commitment to ASIC resistance by Monero is a brilliant example of chaos theory. And I want to go into why. I want to tell you guys a little story. And like any great story of the 21st century, it all starts with a tweet. Specifically, uh, this tweet was by a um, CEO of a company called Astral AR. Astral AR builds drones, of all things. And I was approached over Twitter of all places um, with the concept of mining with drones. That was, that was the first tweet. And I stared at it for a few minutes and I kept blinking my eyes and was like, what, really? And rather than going into detail on Twitter, the CEO was like, no, no, let's just get on a call and I'll tell you, I'll explain it. I was like, oh, okay. So she said, so we build drones that are designed to help police, uh, public service workers, you know, policemen, firemen, you name it. Specifically, they're designed to stop bullets. And I'm sitting here going, hmm, uh-huh, uh-huh. No, really, they have armor that basically disintegrates bullets on impact, and they're deployed above school doorways or behind the cherries of a squad car. And I'm thinking, okay, uh-huh, interesting. And so when they detect a gun, they'll basically swarm the shooter and do their <coughs> best to get in front of the bullet. Now, their job is to keep absorbing bullets and annoy the shooter until a human can disarm them or until help arrives. And they call this the Edna drone. And she goes on to explain that the Edna drone isn't designed to harm people. Instead, it's designed to absorb as many of the bullets as possible in guardian angel mode so that it can end up saving the lives in active shooter zones. And I'm starting to think here, okay, this is pretty cool, but where does mining come into play? And I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, and, you, and you, you wanna mine with these things? Did I hear you correctly? Yeah, well, they have a bunch of hardware inside of them, and if we can figure out a way to monetize them while they're charging, we're, we're able to use some of those profits to help distribute the, the hardware, help the network, lots of good stuff. So what do you say? Do you want to give it a shot? And I'm sitting here thinking, okay, interesting, interesting, processing, processing. And then I think, you know what? You had me at mining. <laughs> so... The first step in this crazy adventure was, of course, to get the hardware that was actually inside the drones. So these drones run on the TX2, NVIDIA's TX2 um, Jetson board, which is actually quite a lot of power packed into a tiny 15-watt board. So inside of it, it has a four-quad um, four quad core arm, as well as a Maxwell GPU. So it's got quite a lot of beef. And I spent about three days obsessing over this, trying to get first the miner to compile, that's not working, fi wondering, okay, are my libraries not work? Why are my libraries not working? Stressing, obsessing over this. I'm starting to let my other duties at work fall off. And I start looking a little bit like this guy. And finally, after about three days of not showing up at the office, my boss calls me. And I'm dreading this call because I really want to finish this project. I really just want to get it out of the way, prove that it actually works, because I think, hang on, we're onto something really cool here. So my boss calls me, and it rings, and it rings, and finally I pick up. And, and before he can even answer, 
I'm like, okay, boss, okay, hear me out. So there's this project. And they're going to be mining with drones. And imagine you could also mine with TVs and fridges. And, and my boss, you have to understand, is a very, very corporate guy. And I can almost hear him visibly face, uh, audibly facepalm on the other end of the phone. Because he knows where this is going to go. He knows that I'm going to do this no matter what. He knows that it's going to be a little bit ridiculous and he's going to end up having to support it. And, well, like a good boss, he does. So we start working on this project collectively as a team at Core Scientific. And many months later, we finally end up with a working prototype. So we tested around an array of hardware to see, does this actually make sense? Can you actually you know, monetize a lot of this embedded hardware and actually do a useful form of proof of work? So first we started with the Jetson TX2 board, which is what the drone is based off of. And there's enough room in this chip, as I said before, for a rhino to run around in. So at 15 watts total power consumption, it pulls 75 hashes per second on Kryptonite R, which is around 5 cents per day. Now, that might not seem like a lot, but remember the purpose of this hardware is to be deployed already in schools or in squad cars. You're not actually buying this hardware to mine with. So any kind of sense you're making per day, it's just a bonus. On top of that, at, at, on Ethereum, 3.1 mega hashes at 8 cents per day. Pretty impressive. So then we're like, okay, let's, let's keep going a bit further. What else can we do? So then we tried with the Jetson Xavier. Now the Xavier board is actually found in most of the AI hardware today. It's found in self-driving cars. It's found in some of the newer drones. It's found in pretty much all of the smart TVs um, that NVIDIA does deploy with uh, different companies. It's actually quite a little bit of a beast. 30 watts total power consumption. It can pull 110 hashes on Kryptonite R at 7 cents per day profit. And surprisingly, 19 mega hash on Ethereum at 51 cents per day. Now we're starting to talk. So then I'm like, okay, okay. And I talk to my team and I'm like, guys, what if, what if, just hear me out, we try it with the fridge? <laughs> because of, it has programmable hardware in it, surely it's, surely it's working. So we hit up Samsung first, because we do not want to reverse engineer a lot of the firmware on the fridge ourselves. And Samsung does not answer our calls for about three weeks straight. Obviously, they think we're a little bit insane. Um, so I put my embedded engineer to work on this. The fridge is down for everyone in the office for a little bit of a while. Uh, little bit of a while. And uh, the whole office starts to think that the tech team is a little bit crazy, and maybe we are. Um, finally, Samsung answers our calls. And they're like, what are, what, sorry, what are you guys trying to do? And we explain the whole concept of, hey, look, we're just doing a bit of a research project, but we actually want to see if we can mine with your smart fridges. And potentially, if we can mine with them, you know, we might be able to help you guys out with some of the threats of IoT and you know, criminals, crypto mining, and trying to get our uh, feet into, uh, um, in the door with Samsung. So they finally decide, OK, we'll help you guys with this. So we try this on uh, the fridge in our office. We end up getting 75 hashes a second on Crypto Night R, 4 cents per day. It's not that effective. And Ethereum's pretty poor at 2 cents per day. So that one wasn't our favorite, but it was fun nonetheless. And so then, finally, we have, of course, three TVs in our office for different conferences. So at this point, you just need to start assuming that anything Samsung makes is destined for mining when it comes to Core Scientific. So the Samsung Smart TV, the QU7000, does a whopping 220 hashes a second for Crypto Night R. That's 14 cents per day profit and 1.4 mega hash for Ethereum at 4 cents per day. Now what's really impressive to me and where I started to think, hang on, we're onto something here, is there were 46 million smart TVs sold in 2018. That's a potential for almost $6.4 million daily revenue in mining. Hang on, maybe, just maybe, we're onto something when it comes to wealth distribution. So finally, none of those hash rates were actually optimized. That was us just getting the software up and running. So now as we've started to realize that, hey, we have something on our hands, we've started to go through the optimization rounds. And we are expecting anywhere from a 20 to a 50% increase in performance. Now you might ask, why on earth are we doing this? 
Oh, and lest we forget, just in case people think I'm crazy, never forget Bitfury developed a light bulb that automatically mines Bitcoin when you screw it in. The philosophy now that I'm going by is, you know, if it has an IP address, it's mining for me. So, like I said, that's great and all, but why are we doing this? Why, why on earth would we go to all of this, you know, trouble, all of this research into just proving that, yes, if it's programmable hardware, it can mine? Well, part of it is because proof of work is powerful. See, proof of work has a very unique property of being able to monetize hardware while it's idle. No other kind of compute marketplace can do that in the world today. And when you can monetize idle hardware, some, some certain characteristics can come into play and some unique, I would say, synergies are also, um, also at play. Specifically, some of the cool things that can happen is this enables creative hardware financing. So going back to the Astral uh, AR scenario, part of what we uh, teamed up to do together was figure out how could we mine with these drones so that they could be given to schools free of charge and while they were idle, be making back their money slowly so that schools wouldn't have to put the upfront capital to have this life-saving technology. Now, proof of work is the only form of compute where revenue is instantly recognized and repeatable. No other form of compute has that. AI doesn't have that. In an AI marketplace, you do need a buyer and a seller. With proof of work, you just immediately uh, deploy your compute power and you get uh, revenue back for it. That is incredibly powerful. Now, it might not seem like it's very effective, but if hardware can pay back for itself over a period of five to ten years, all of a sudden, this enables consumer discounts. So, as an example, companies would be glad to give you $10 off your purchase if this is made back over the lifetime of the machine. Further, company, um, companies like Nintendo, with the Nintendo Switch, would love to be able to do, you know, some creative gift codes or uh, in-game uh, gamer discounts if all of a sudden, while while the device was charging, you know, the Nintendo Switch was monetized. This is a creative world where, you know, corporations are starting to intersect with some of the mining ecosystem. Now, this also enables st network stability. So, generally dedicated hardware is not going to stay locked into a network. It's going to bounce around to whatever is most profitable. Now, embedded hardware is going to stay locked into, a ch into one chain. There is usually not enough space on the actual embedded hardware to have multiple different kinds of kernels. And bouncing around to different chains has different um, energy consumptions. So for instance, if it's locked into Monero, there's, um, there's repeatable, uh, repeatable energy consumption and predictable energy consumption, which means people can estimate back what is their ROI, and they also don't have to deal with any um, issues with quality control, etc extra heat generated, things that you know you can't really account or predict for. It also enables fairer wealth distribution. So as, as the core scientific team started thinking about this, my chief product officer, Ganesh, who spent a good portion of his life uh, with Amazon Prime and Twitch, started saying, hang on, if we could deploy this technology in Ind India, all of a sudden, you know, people could have access to phones. This, this kind of monetization can enable a lot fairer wealth distribution. Then I started thinking, well, hang on, if a phone could, uh, could afford to pay off its phone bill, you know, the one billion unconnected could join the connected world right today. And that's possible. So Astral AR and Core Scientific launched something that we're calling Project Palladium. Project Palladium is an initiative to change how hardware is financed in the world. Now, we don't know if we're going to make a big enough impact, but we're at least trying. So Project Palladium is only possible on chains like Monero. Specifically, it's only possible on chains that decide to target consumer-grade hardware. No manufacturer is going to put an ASIC chip in their, con in their consumer devices. It's never going to happen. Um, there's, there's all sorts of security reasons why that won't happen, legal reasons why it won't happen, and quite frankly, it's just a nuisance. But with a consumer-grade chain, people will jump into that. Companies are more, I would say, often incentivized or eager to experiment at these kinds of different uh, wealth distribution. It's also a step towards useful proof of work. So one of the biggest complaints that I get in, uh, in, in my job is um, people always come to me and say, hey, Bitcoin mining is incredibly wasteful. 
Monero mining is incredibly wasteful. XYZ mining is incredibly wasteful. Well, it's only wasteful if, uh, it, you know, if you don't find the monetization model of proof of work useful. Now, it's already being used in the ecosystem, but so far only ASIC manufacturers have utilized it in this manner. Specifically, ASIC manufacturers mine with the hardware before they sell it to consumers. We don't actually want that. What would be way better is if all of a sudden the hardware was much cheaper, it was deployed, and then it was paying back over a period of X amount of years. And the other th important thing to understand about Project Palladium is it's not about break even, and it's not about ROI. So in contrast to traditional mining, where you're trying to get back your sunk cost as soon as possible, this consumer grade hardware is already brought for other purposes and has other monetization strategies. So Project Palladium is a way to extend monetization and provide sustained security to a different chain. Now, Project Palladium is uh, actually run by um, two of the projects that we're pretty proud of and that we're giving you guys a sneak peek of here. Um, we haven't shown this to anyone and we've been in stealth for about eight months now as Core Scientific. So first is Minder OS. Minder OS is our embedded operating system that kind of powers our entire data centers. Um, and what Minder OS does for Project Palladium is it actually allows the tokenization of hardware. That is, tying a machine's unique identifier and other metrics of the machine to a digital token for identification and access control deployed on the Monero blockchain. Now, each token has its own pair of access keys that allow the owner of the device to modify and manage the device. It also has custom APIs. So embedded hardware running Minder OS can only receive commands that are signed by a private key associated with the digital token, and you know, subsequently the machine's unique identifier. And also has inherent optimization built in. So Minder OS automatically adjusts clocks, memory timings, and other hardware characteristics to suit the algorithm it is working with. And version two, which we're scheduling for public release in uh, 2020, has its own compiler specifically for cryptocurrency mining. It's also powered by Minder. So Minder is what we call our intelligent infrastructure. Think of Minder like what lives in the cloud and Minder OS like what lives on the machine. Minder is designed and built to prevent 51% attacks. Specifically, it monitors for hash rate dips in the network and it alerts human workers. It has a mode called Lancelot mode where Minder will automatically fill lost hash rate with hardware that it's currently managing. So if it sees a massive dip in the Monero hash rate because a bunch of GPUs have gone offline, it will immediately deploy hash rate under its control to fill that gap. This helps keep a sustained network going forward. It also has automatic conversion in place. So most of the participants that we've uh, signed up to Project Palladium cannot hold cryptocurrency for various legal reasons or whatever. So instead, through smart contracts on uh, the Ethereum blockchain, mining rewards are instantly converted to a handful of fiat currencies. So this is a really great way to get people um, sort of into cryptocurrency without forcing them. Because then when you do it like this, when you start converting mining rewards into fiat, they start getting really curious. Then what we've often found is they start reaching out to us and saying, hey, you know, I'd actually like to convert a bit of my payout into Monero instead. Could you do a 70-30% split? Then, then you get them hooked. <laughs> um, and just for some amusement, we did, try, uh, we did try mining with a few other things. So I do not recommend mining with these three things. Um, one is your pacemaker. We did, uh, we did research into that. Uh, well, it doesn't have Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, and actually the increased heat's actually gonna damage your heart muscles, so do not do that. That was an interesting conversation with the uh, hospital. Um, speakers, terrible latency and continuously interrupts the sound quality. We had some uh, pretty uh, beefy Bluetooth speakers. They didn't produce anything, it's terrible. And also your Roomba. So, the rumor is the one thing I really want to tackle, but for some reason its processor is actually at 95% utilization while it's charging. I haven't cracked that case, but I want to figure out how do we mine with Roombas. <laughs> so final conclusions is that Project Palladium is only made possible because of Monero's commitment to decentralized and fair mining. And I want that to sink in. Because what Core Scientific and Astral AR are going to do is ensure one of every single one of these drones are in schools across America. And that is seriously only possible because Monero exists today. Because Monero is doing research 
to proof-of-work algorithms that are for consumer-grade hardware. No other chain can support this. No other chain has that dedication. So when the media asks you why you're fighting ASICs, you can tell them it's for the drones. <laughs> so, do we have any questions? Because I'm sure there's a few. <laughs> Hey, just a quick question about um, mining difficulty mm -hmm. adjustments, because I think that could be an issue with monetizing hardware, because if they sell you something expecting in 10 years to get back $10 worth of Monero or a set amount, that would change over time based on mining difficulty. So how have you addressed that or kind of factored that into your calculations? So definitely. So the big, uh, so Leah will also be speaking today a little bit about that, so I don't want to spoil her talk. But when I've uh, been talking to a lot of um, the companies as well, the big thing we say is, hey, this isn't a promise of returns, but what it's going to mean is that, you know, you're doing something good for maybe a $10 profit, uh, you know, discount. Most of the companies are very open to that idea. Now, difficulty, um, you know, difficult changes will happen, but you also have to make, make um, some sort of, how to say this, you have to um, assume that you have to have a good handle of what kind of hardware is going to be deployed into the network as we go on year after year. Right now, the amount of um, consumer-grade hardware that has been deployed to the Monero ne uh, network has been kind of predictable if we discount all the ASICs that jump in and the FPGAs. What our vision is and what our hope is, is that with random X, the difficulty curve is actually going to be very predictable. So we factor all of that into our calculations. So usually we um, do a very aggressive assumption of a 3% uh, increase every month, which I think is pretty brutal, but you know, it covers our butts. Um, so I have a, I guess a two part question. One is, so running these processors at you know, close to 100% usage, I guess, or utilization, certainly it's going to generate more heat than they would if they were just sitting there charging. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you all had any data or, or, you know, experience looking at that. And then the second part is also running those at such a high utilization is probably going to deteriorate the lifespan of those processors. And if so, wondering if that's been worked into your calculations on profitability or actually mm -hmm. feasibility of doing that. So part of it is that um, chips are designed to dissipate so many watts per heat, and actually when they're tested in factories, most of them are tested over at 100% utilization over uh, a period of anywhere from 25 to 55 years. At least that's how they do it in the GPU space. With ASICs, they're a little bit more brutal. Now, it varies from chip manufacturer to chip manufacturer, but usually when we're working with these hardware companies, um, that comes into play. So in Samsung's case, when they stress test these chips, they do it um, over a period, a s aggressive period of testing where they simulate 200 years of operation at this 100% uh, utilization. It's actually not too bad. So the second piece is that um, just because you're crypto mining doesn't actually mean you're at 100% utilization. That all comes into how you pipeline your algorithm, how you fold it, how do you optimize it. So what we try and specialize in is fitting, fitting the utilization to the specific task. Now on the third piece is um, a specific case to Astral AR, specifically where Astral AR requested 100% utilization because what it actually does is help, uh, help with their battery's lifespan. They have uh, really, really powerful batteries um, from what I understood. And uh, I know Leah will go into detail this, and expensive, that need 100% utilization to keep their life cycle, which was pretty impressive. So that was actually a request. Um, so we factored that in. But knowing everything we know and working with the manufacturers, most of them, you know, assume that it's going to be okay. The other piece to understand is that with the TX2 uh, and the Xavier, they do run at 15 or 30 watts. But for instance, with the smart TV, it actually only consumed an extra 7 watts, which was pretty, pretty awesome, actually. That could account for, you know, companies that have low voltage drop, etc. So it wasn't too bad on that. Coming soon at, in Q4 2019. <laughs> uh, 
So hopefully this wasn't addressed in the speech and I missed it, but uh, is Core Scientific assisting with these manufacturers you mentioned like uh, Samsung? So is Core Scientific assisting with maybe ARM FPGA architecture uh, to help the efficiencies of these future uh, products? Uh, no, we're, we're not assisting like that. Um, mostly they've responded to my very, very silly requests, I guess out of respect. Um, but generally, you know, Samsung has a, a hundred man team of fantastic FPGA engineers, so they definitely don't need assistance from us. That was an amazing presentation. Thank you. I got here a little bit late. Maybe I missed it in case I did that. I'll have a backup question, but I'm wondering if your minder had, can monitor or, or can uh, help you help you to access the value of things like unlimited data plans where you might have a value providing not CPU resources but your network connection out through these um, unlimited data plans or you mentioned the, the Nintendo Switch. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a way to use the chat channel um, as kind of a backup layer for sending messages. It, can you think of a way, you don't have to answer now, but is Minder able to access or to, to manage the monetization of those other resources that these systems have, or is it just CPU? Thank you. That is our vision for Minder, though we're not there yet. We're easily about four, four to five years away because building a general global compute marketplace actually takes a hell of a lot of time. But that is our plan and our vision for the software. All right, everybody, thanks again. We have limited time, so we can't ask any more questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.